Hi, good morning everyone. My name is Richard Su. Um, okay. I just graduated from Post Lab. I'm currently a um, postdoc researcher at this lab. So this is, uh, before I give my talk, I want to personally thank this program for giving our students this opportunity to do this very nice impact, impactful work. I came all the way from China. You know, China is, you know, has this energy problems in China. I'm really glad that I have opportunity to work on this area and hopefully one day that I can, you know, contribute to the problem of in China. So today I'm, I'm going to talk about part of my PhD research uh, on a topic of sensing systems for energy efficiency buildings. I have the privilege to work with Paul, P Professor Paul Wright and Professor Wright, uh, Richard White on this project. So, um, so the outline of this talk, I'm going to give you some introduction about this project and I'm going to talk about specifically on this um, technology as we call it stick-on electricity meters. And I'm going to talk about the commercializing plans that Paul has already mentioned a little bit about our company. And last, uh, hopefully we all have some time for the uh, questions and answers. So, as we all know that building consumes a lot of energy. 70% of electricity in the U.S. goes into the buildings. M majority of all our activities we, we do is under, under the roof, right? So that translates to 40% of CO2 emissions, which equates to 2.2 billion tons of CO2. I can even visualize how, much, how, much, how many tons, how, how, how large the volumes that is. I can only visualize maybe one cubic meters of water, and a one tons of water, that's one cubic meters. So this is actually a very, very big problem. But if you look at this from different perspective, as a scientist and engineer, it also represents a very big opportunities. So, right, so if we can improve the energy efficiency buildings by, for say, 10%, 15%, we are you know, solving the global warming problems uh, in, a, in a very significant way. So, to me, what matters most is not a specific technology, but instead is, is a systematic way of looking into this problem and see how can we mass produce energy efficiency in buildings. So to me, it's the, uh, the first step, I think, is to get better understanding how, of how we use energy in buildings and um, to see you know, what would be the lowest cost way to um, monitor energy efficiency in buildings. Not only to improve the performance of buildings, just to treat energy efficiency as a product, as a service. And, and we've come up with ways to um, mass produce that service. So let's look at our existing technologies. So in terms of getting the data out of buildings. We're currently using um, extensively the technology called current transformer to measure energy using buildings. It is a 100 old technology that you know you have to wrap around the conductors in order to get the current that flows through that conductors. Okay, it is very expensive. Uh, each of this current transformer costs about 20 to 30 dollars, and it's heavy and bulky because in order to measure it, you need to have a flux concentrator that's made of ferromagnetic material. So logistics can be a problem, you know, and also it's very heavy. Because of the uh, just because of the material, the, the des design of the sensors, and of course, in order to measure the electricity out in front of the circuit breaker panels, you need to hire electricians to do that. Certified electricians putting on the suits, you know, going into the building, take off the panels, and clamp on each of these uh, sensors. That's very costly. So as a result, these kind of metering. Um, uh, solution usually costs five to ten k US dollars per panel, and this building will probably have five panels each floor, seventh floor, thirty-five panels. So ten k, that's almost half a million dollars to just to put on these, these sensors in this building. So what we would like to do is we were trying to find a solution that's ten times cheaper, ten times faster, and most also very importantly, ten times sexier. <laughs> Because nowadays people don't want to use these these kind of you know very a lot of wire in the buildings. They want to see the the products is really nicely looking. So this is at the beginning of this project we have this vision inspired by all these problems. Uh, we envision that you know if we can have a sensing systems 
that can be used you know, to put it on the surface of these breakers without making physical contact to the conductors and measures things like voltage, current, phase angle, harmonics, uh, and all these information about how you use energy in buildings. And by, by doing that, the installation of these systems does, will not require <coughs> the use of electricians, such that it becomes much cheaper, much faster, and allows the large-scale deployment of this nice uh, energy monitoring product. And um, then we started to work on this sensor. So the, this sensor is made of two parts. The first part is a voltage sensor. So the design of the voltage sensor is really, really simple. It's straightforward. Everyone has a smartphone, has a touch screen. It works similar as the touch. So basically, is if you put your fingers on the, fing on the, on the, uh, on the cell phone, your body becomes the ground, right? There's a current induced from the electrodes embedded in your cell phone to a body, and the cell phone detects which electrode uh, has a current induced, being induced. By doing this, the cell phone knows where our finger, finger is. Similarly, what we, what we did is to put a conductive plate near that, the circuit to be measured, which is right here, right? So it induces, because this is AC, uh, AC voltage, it induces <coughs> a, a little bit, tiny little current goes through that resistors. And then we measure that, that current using a current to voltage converter. It's a simplified circuit right here. So you got the voltage output at the end, which is proportional to the amount of current that being induced. And the current is also proportional to the magnitude of the voltage you're trying to measure. So, this sensor, and then you do some you know, analog processing here in order to get the waveform you desired, right, you like. So this, right now the sensor, the output of this voltage sensor is not only in phase with the voltage to be measured, but also the output is proportional to the voltage to be, to be measured as well. So by doing this, we're able to measure the, first of all, the, the phase of the voltage, right? So you use the phase as a, as a reference to tell the, the, the phase angle of the load that connects, connected to this circuit. And we, are, we can also measure the frequency of the voltage. Sometimes line, right, line frequency fluctuates by 0 0.2, 0 0.3 hertz, so you'll be able to track that shift of frequencies in the line. So, and then also you're, you're able to track the, the fluctuation of the 120 volts, the amplitude of the voltage as well. So, we have a voltage sensor that can be used on the, on the surface on, on the, from, uh, to measure the voltage without making physical contact to conductors from outside of the circuit breakers. So the more challenging, uh, the most challenging part of this project is actually measuring the current, right? This is because you, if the fact that you place a con con conductor plate near the conductor, you're actually changing the field, the electric field. But in this, when you measure the magnetic field, you're not changing anything because magnetic field is a vector field, it's additive. So this, is, this is plot you're seeing here is the magnetic field distribution on the surface of circuit breaker panel when you have 10 amps of current going through <coughs> breaker, breaker three and there's no current going through these two breakers. So one breakers, only one breaker carries current and you see that magnetic field distribution. This is three axis. This plot is the Z axis, this way, uh, X axis. And this is Y and this is Z. All the plane is Z. So these are the three axis distribution of the magnetic field. One thing you can notice is that um, if you put a sensor on circuit two, the sensors will be sensitive to the current in circuit one. And then we refer this, we call this problem as the crosstalk problem. So how do you think about a way to mitigate the crosstalk such that you place your sensors on circuit three, it only picks up the signals from circuit three, not, and then sensor is not being affected by any current in circuit two. This is one challenge. The second challenge is calibrations. How do we calibrate the sensors? So we want to know how much current is being used, right? So if you put the sensors on break, circuit breakers, it measures magnetic field. How can we interpret the magnetic field uh, and, and then translate that into current readings. So there's 
actually a number of ways to doing that. First of all, most obvious is, you know, you're just plugging, plugging a load, plugging a load into the circuit, and then you use it as a ref reference load, and then you observe the change of voltage output in sensors. And also, you can do, you know, you can do, uh, cal you, can, you can calibrate it from the, cal uh, from the main meter. A lot of these circuits are connected to the main meters. By looking at the time series data in the main meter, by identifying a particular low switching event, and attribute that low switching event to, to the particular circuit, you're able to calibrate it automatically in that way. And also, of course, you can pre-calibrate the sensors uh, w w uh, for a particular uh, breaker in the manufacturers. So here is an example of how, how we mitigate. So we use multi-point magnetic field sensing and apply a certain algorithms that can be implemented through analog circuitry. So this is and then we can filter out a wanted signal. Let me just show you an example. There's two load on circuit one and circuit, uh, circuit, circuit two, respectively. So I'm putting a sensor on circuit one. When the, when the load one is switched on, it, when the load one is switched on, you see the, the raw output and the corrected output both goes up. When you apply, and when there's a load interfering load on, on neighboring circuit is switched on, the raw output is being affected due to the crosstalk issues. And when you apply that, that mitig signal mitigation algorithms, the, cr the interference is gone. So we, so we have successfully demonstrated a way to mitigate that crosstalk problems. And this is another example that we put the sensors on the circuit breakers, to 22 different sensors. We want to see how reproducible reprodu that, that method is. We fabricated 20, 222 sensors, and you can see the red the green one is the signal from the, from the current to be measured, and the green is the output due to the crosstalk. So the crosstalk has been at least 95% being, uh, being eliminated. So I'm going to show you some history of this project real quick. 2008, we have this, 2009, we started to work on this project, proof of concept. We designed this, uh, we used electromechanical sensors, no voltage measurement capability at that time. Calibration is required for crosstalk mitigation. And then in 2010, we improved the design that we incorporate the voltage sensors and we're able to measure harmonics and phase and we have this new mitigation, uh, cross-talk mitigation algorithms. So where we at in terms of 2014? As Paul mentioned, Jason and I started a company called Persistent Efficiency that we're trying to commercialize this technology. So the reason I, we work, I work with Jason is he's, he's his PhD research is on, on the topic of data analytics. He applies statistical process control in, term, in, in improving the energy efficiency in buildings. So he needs data. I design hardware to produce data. So that's a very complementary technologies. So that we work together and trying to. So let me just give you one example of how these technologies can work together. First of all, if you imagine there's 100 buildings in San Francisco, and Jason's algorithms can, can apply Jason's algorithms to uh, the algorithms, static particle control algorithms to uh, analyze, um, apply it to the main meter, the whole building aggregated meter, and pick up those uh, energy uh, buildings with most potential for energy uh, saving, uh, energy saving opportunities. In other words, the least energy efficient buildings. And then we can, we can install the, the stick on sensors in each floor, each building in order to pinpoint where the problem exactly are. So, and then after I got the data from uh, at a higher granularity, the same algorithm can be applied to, to analyze the individual loads and individual floor plans. Then we can provide continuous maintain, uh, energy efficient service in this building. This is just one example there that we were still working on other cases to see what are the best solutions can, we can use this to, to technology to help people uh, improve energy efficiency in buildings. So this is the current prototype. We call it Power Patch, and uh, the background is the data it collects. And we deployed this, this, these sensors in this building in Chicago. It's a 51-story building in downtown Chicago. It's managed by the very famous nationwide building management manage company, and this building is the most energy-efficient buildings in Chicago downtown. So, um, and this is the pictures of its deployment, and let um, me just show you some sample data. Right, what you see here is powered by SMAP. Let's see this one. 
right? So you can clearly see here their activity in that buildings in this particular circuit and then turns off during the night and starts to turn on in the morning, right? So, real, so this is the data from the same circuit over a period of one month, four weeks. Each row is, represents one week, each block is one, one day. So you can clearly see the patterns of the weekend, right? <coughs> this is the weekend, the energy use is very low, and this is weekdays. And remember, all these days are collected by the stichometers, very accurately from the stichometers. And you can clearly see this weekend, maybe there's some activity in this weekend, weekend, and then we clearly want to investigate what's happening on that day. So that could just give you examples of what we can do with data collected from these stichon sensors. And lastly, I want to thank you, everyone, for you know, the help. And this work is funded by CEC. And I want to particularly thank you for my two advisors, um, and uh, Dan Chapman, of the lab, lab manager, who did a lot of uh, work for, um, the, for the lab. And also Professor Igor Propatini, Chris Sherman, Pitt, and Jason for the contribution of my work. And of course, other lab in our lab. Go AME. Thank you. We have time for a couple of questions, but uh, please wait for the microphone because this uh, session is being recorded. Uh, please identify yourself, Terry. My name is Robert Van Busker <coughs> from Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Um, sort of a comment and a, and a question is uh, there's quite a few um, uh, companies working in the smart meter space. Right. And one of the one of the benefits of what you have is it's a cheap, cheaper way of doing something that's close to non-intrusive load monitoring. Right, right. The, the, the other huge potential benefit of non-intrusive load monitoring is that if you develop a cloud of that and the events are product change out events or product installation events, you could actually by model number or by product type mm -hmm. come up with a field at energy as a field estimate of the average energy use of those products. Right. And so instead of having a measurement that's based on a test laboratory, mm -hmm. you could actually have measurements of how products operate in field in the field as their efficiency rating. And if those products had behavioral interactions that allowed them to be used more efficiently in the field, then you could incorporate behavioral energy savings benefits into product ratings because what what is difficult in products that are interacting with people's behavior mm -hmm. is that if it's the behavioral interaction that's saving the energy it's very hard to come up with a test procedure in a laboratory that that credits the right product exactly that so so the project i talked about in chicago this is actually uh started from a tenant engagement pro program they want to feed back the real-time data to the, to the tenants and see how much energy they can be saved just by providing them the raw data of how much the energy they use. So, yeah, it's a very good point. Hi, this is Rosa Arianda, UC Berkeley CIEE. Uh, I'm wondering, can you measure short circuit current with this uh, sensor and can, can you have indication of the, the switch Health status, if switch malfunction, right. can you? Right, exactly. We, we can measure current, and it depends on the sampling frequency of the systems. So if, if the, the short circuit would be a, a spike, that's in the last certain amount of time, so <laughs> delta T, as long as our sampling frequency can cap, capture that delta T, then we are able to measure, measure that, that surge of current. So. Your current measurement range is enough to capture short circuit. Well, the current. range it can be set, set, right? So if you see, hey, this is 20 amps of current, what we measure is 25 amps. We, we set the range of 25 amps. That it reached the maximum rating, the breakers is probably need to well be tripped because the rated is at 20 amps, right? So. I think maybe we'll have to keep going and uh, you can uh, ask Richard questions uh, offline. Thank you.